Hello everyone. Welcome to another episode of Retina Roundup. I'm Dr. Vinakshi Mahesh, fellow in Vitro Retina and Ocular Oncology. Let's review some of this month's interesting articles. The first article describes the increased risk of intraoperative complications during cataract surgery in eyes which have had previous intravitreal therapy. Approximately 9,8,000 eyes that underwent cataract surgery were included in the registry data and the overall complication rate was 0.86%. Adjusted risk factors for developing the complications included the need for rexis hooks, capsular blue staining, or surgeon inexperience. Previous intramitral therapy also increased the risk of intraoperative complications with an odds ratio of 1.45 indicating cataract surgeons should be aware of potential risks when operating on patients who have had previous intravitreal treatments. Coming to Article 2, investigators conducted a retrospective chart review of 371 patients diagnosed with idiopathic vitromacular traction over a six-year period to understand the long-term clinical course of vitromacular traction. The mean follow-up period was 34.2 months and patients were initially managed with observation only. Spontaneous release of vitromacular traction occurred in 25% of those with grade 1, VMT, 15% of those with grade 2, and 6% of those with grade 3. Stable vitromacular traction grade was the most favorable frequent outcome, and eyes with grade 1 vitromacular traction were more likely to undergo spontaneous release than eyes with grade 2 or 3. 22% of all eyes eventually received pass planar vitrectomy and 3% of eyes received ocriplasmin intravitreal injection. Moving ahead to the next article, which was to compare the clinical outcomes in eyes with refractory diabetic macular edema managed by vitrectomy combined with and without intentional macular detachment. 41 eyes with diabetic macular edema that was poorly responsive to anti-VEGF underwent pass planar vitrectomy with internal limiting membrane healing. 21 of these eyes underwent a combined intentional macular detachment. Mean follow-up was 29.7 weeks, where they noted that a mean central retinal thickness reduction was greater in the group that underwent an intentional macular detachment as compared to the non-intentional macular detachment group at 1, 2, and 4 weeks, but the results were almost similar at 12 and 24 weeks. There was no significant difference in the mean changes of best corrected visual activity from baseline to the 24 weeks endpoint in either group. Vitrectomy can release the macular edema in eyes with refractory diabetic macular edema. Combined with intentional macular detachment, patients seem to achieve a faster central retinal thickness reduction, but neither the final morphological outcome nor the visual acuity was affected. Our next article relates retinal microvasculature and heart failure prevention. Endothelial dysfunction and microvascular disease plays an important role in development and progression of heart failure. Retinal imaging provides to be a unique opportunity to non-invasively assess vascular structure and function, vessel features, and microcirculation within the retina. Accumulating evidence suggests that retinal vascular caliber, microvascular features, and vascular characteristics extracted from various imaging modalities are associated with alterations in the left ventricular structure and function in stage B heart failure, and as well as incident development of symptomatic heart failure in the general population. Moreover, dynamic retinal vessel analysis has been shown to differentiate heart failure patients based on their phenotypes. Given the increasing availability of rapid imaging acqui acquisition devices, such as the non midriatic wide field systems and the smartphone based retinal cameras, and the integration of artificial intelligence based interrogation or assessment techniques, retinal imaging is a promising non invasive tool which, in conjunction with cardiac imaging and biomarkers, helps to prevent heart failure and also risk stratified among those at risk of developing heart failure. On similar lines, the next article investigates the association between intermittent fasting and age-rated macular degeneration in the general adult population. A total of 4,504 individuals aged more than or equal to 55 years with comprehensive data, including mean frequency and fundus photography, was selected and divided into two groups based on 
the frequency of taking breakfast per week. That is intermittent fasting where they took nearly zero times per week and non-fasting group where they took five to seven times per week. Age-related macular degeneration was identified in 25.1% of the total population. The intermittent fasting group had a decreased risk of age-related macular degeneration as compared with the non-fasting group with an adjusted odds ratio of 0.413. This was especially seen in younger individuals, those who were obese and those who had an urban residence. Increasing age and serum high-density lipoprotein levels were also independent risk factors for the development of AMD. Hence, they concluded that intermittent fasting was associated with reduced risk of AMD. We now discuss the two-year outcomes of triple therapy with standard fluence photodynamic therapy, intravitreal injection of ranimizumab or aflibercept, and a subtenal injection of triamcinolone acetonide for neovascular age-related macular degeneration in Japanese patients. 44 eyes with treatment-naive neovascular AMD followed for more than 24 months were evaluated. The mean age was 73.3 years with a plus or minus 10 years and the mean best corrected visual acuity significantly improved from 0 0.61 plus or minus 0 0.3 at baseline to 0 0.50 plus or minus 0 0.46 at 24 months. Central retinal thickness also significantly improved from 373 plus or minus 162 microns at baseline to 207 plus or minus 107 microns at 24 months. The number of treatments given during the two-year treatment period was 2.7 plus or minus 1.8. No retreatments were necessary in 18 or 44 eyes, with no significant difference between the intravitreal ranimizumab or the intravitreal aflibercept group in the two-year period. Four eyes temporarily required anti-glaucoma medications, and hence they concluded that the induction treatment with triple therapy resulted in approximately 40% of the patients requiring no retreatment for almost two years. The type of anti-VEGF agents used made no difference in the result. The last interesting article investigates the value of the retinal nerve fiber layer, thickness in the optic disc, and the cross-sectional area of the lower limb nerves in the diagnosis of diabetic peripheral neuropathy separately and in combination. A total of 140 patients with type 2 diabetes were enrolled, including 51 patients with diabetic peripheral neuropathy and 89 without TPN. Along with clinical data, biochemical parameters, electromyography of the nerve, and OCT for RNFL thickness of the optic disc were performed. Color Doppler ultrasound was performed to measure the cross-sectional area of the lower limb nerves. The RNFL thickness was lower, and the cross-sectional area of the tibial nerve in the diabetic peripheral neuropathy group was larger than in the non-peripheral neuropathy group. The albumin to urine creatinine ratio, diabetic retinopathy, and the cross-sectional area of the tibial nerve at 3 cm were positively correlated with diabetic peripheral neuropathy. The RNFL thickness in the superior quadrant of the optic disc was negatively correlated with diabetic peripheral neuropathy. Patients with diabetic peripheral neuropathy have a reduction of the RNFL thickness and an increase of the cross-sectional area of the tibial nerve, and these two changes are related to diabetic peripheral neuropathy. The RNFL thickness of the optic disc and the cross-sectional area of the tibial nerve can hence be used as diagnostic markers of diabetic peripheral neuropathy, and the combination of these two indicators has a higher diagnostic value of the same. That sums up the interesting articles of this month. Thank you for your patient listening.